So without further ado, coming to the stage, Dawn Staley, North Philly's own. Yeah, you got you got to say North Philly because uh, <laughs> what's up, y'all? <laughs> you do. You got to get real specific. See, I'm from Detroit, and we do it the same way. It's like you do. You say you're from the D, East Side or West Side. Three one three. What up, though? I see y'all out here. <laughs> so, Dawn, we're here live at the, the Roots Picnic, and I feel like it's in this setting because I'm in your hometown that I have the opportunity to just tell you I've been like beefing with you in my mind for 25 years. Oh. And this is why, and I hate to admit this here in front of all these people, particularly because there's a space tournament going on here at the Roots <laughs> Picnic, right? Dawn Staley ran a Boston on me. You don't even remember this. I'm going to tell you, you ran a Boston on me. Look at her, she getting comfy now. This is good. This is a true story, Dawn. When you were playing with the Charlotte Sting, Tracy Reed, one of your former teammates, a friend of mine, Tracy invited me to come down and to hang out. And somehow we wound up, wherever we were hanging out with, it was you and Rhonda Mapp. <laughs> and we played spades, and this woman ran a Boston on me. And that, I, that has never happened to me in my life. <laughs> it's never well, happened. Well, it well, happened one time, and it ain't happened since. Well, you, you're actually one of many. <laughs> so that's why I didn't remember it you know what? vividly. Because you, you're, you're like, she was looking at me like I was lying. And I'm just like, come on now. Come on now. <laughs> like, Don, that was cruel. That was cruel, man. I, I actually can I can actually play a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> you think? I, I, I play a little bit. <laughs> I, I contend those cards were marked. Something <laughs> happened. <laughs> Somehow you cheated. But uh, so I've been waiting 25 years to, to tell you that. I just want you to know. But you've had such a, an amazing journey and an amazing career, and you're coming off another amazing accomplishment, winning a national championship, South Carolina. Um, so what does this one feel like compared to the one you won in 2017? Um, th this one actually feels a lot more special because when you win your first one, and when you win your first one and it wasn't against UConn, they don't think it's legit. So because we were able to play UConn and beat UConn, and, 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 and don't get me wrong, they are the standard in women's basketball, but when you beat them, it legitimizes it for everybody else. Although 2017 is, 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 is a, it's a great year, um, and it's a national championship in my book, but for, for everybody else that really doesn't believe that basketball exists outside of uh, stores, Connecticut, I mean, it felt really good to be able to, to do it and do it in the fashion that we did it. Mm. Um, but what's your life been like <laughs> since winning that title? I'm, it, it's been great. I, I actually have been to some places that I've never been. I've been on some television shows, uh, um, Trevor Noah, mm -hmm. I, I think he's incredibly intelligent. I don't know if y'all know. Do y'all know Trevor? <laughs> Tre Trevor gives it up, like, <laughs> with receipts. Re and then I, I felt this special connection with him. I did. Like, we had good chemistry. And I don't know why, because I don't, I mean, usually I'm more reserved. But he actually made me talk. He made me just talk about things, and it felt just really comfortable. That, that was great. But I, I'll tell you this, the most gratifying experience of this, of all of it was actually our parade. The parade, when you drive down Main Street in Columbia, South Carolina, and it wasn't just because it's Main Street, it's, it's the people. Like, I was in a car, the first time we did it, I was in like a bus and we kind of looked down and you wave. But we were in a car this time and the people were ready to risk it all. They jump in the car and they just scream at the top of their lungs like, we love you, like you're the GOAT. Like seriously, it did my, you know, it did my confidence level, you know, something special. <laughs> because, but it was beautiful because in South Carolina, which is, they got a rich history of racism and, and anything that you can imagine. And then they are cheering hard, like, like hard, they're pointing. And then they're, you know, they're like, we love you. Thank you for what you've done. And I, I really felt that just deeply, like on another level because of, you know, some of them said they did, they've never been on campus because they weren't allowed to be on campus. Mm. So, and then if I go to a grocery store, you do have to listen to South Carolinians because they, they like to tell you the history. <laughs> they like to tell you their business. 
And some of them say, I've never been on that campus except to see you all play. And that's breaking down barriers. That's, that's something truly is special about being there more than just winning because we're able to culturally, you know, have, have black people feel like it's their state too. So I'm, I'm super proud. Like God, God is, is, is incredibly, uh, he's mysterious and he works in incredible ways. Like I was supposed to be in South Carolina. Like it, you know, my path, I've said it plenty of times that it's divinely ordered and it wasn't just ordered to, to win championships. It, it was to bring, bring people together. I want to talk more about the culture you built there, but before we get into that, I'm going to ask you a question that I ask every guest that appears on Jamel Hill is unbothered. When did you become unbothered? Um, it, it was probably when my mother died and you know, and I, I find myself as a young child, you, you get embarrassed by your mother because your mother says some things that you can't believe she said. Like, and then it's embarrassing because you're just, you know, you're like, okay, okay, let me just move to the left, <laughs> right? And then, and then when she died, it was like she came back through me to use my voice and just, I'm, I'm you know, the, the imagination has been taken away from, like, I'm, George Floyd, I will say that, his death. There was no imagination. You saw it, like you look and you see it and you see somebody take their last breath and it, it, it moves you to a place where you just, it's unbelievable. Like you can, you can, you can kind of imagine someone dying in police custody and it's like, okay, well, this could have happened, that could have happened. This, no, we saw someone die at the hands of a police officer who could have easily just got up and we could avoid it, you know, that whole thing. But, you know, his family, I, I, I believe, um, I think they can see the significance of his death, of his murder. And now there's a, there's a movement in our country that that's not going to, continue to just lie down and allow it to happen. Another thing you've been extremely vocal about is pay equity. Pay equity for um, women's coaches compared to men. And you recently signed a big ass deal, <laughs> $22 million at South Carolina. Yes, I'm putting your business out there because I think it's important that people know. Um, but 20, 22.5. My bag, I underbossed her. See. That's what I needed to stay in my lane. And she corrected me. I receive it, sis. I receive it. <laughs> yes. 22.4. My bag. Um, but this is a landmark contract. You're the highest paid black female coach ever. Um, what's the significance of that for you? Um, I'm going to give you all the whole story because I don't think I've told the whole story. And the whole story is this. Um, back in 2021, at the, at the Final Four in San Antonio, um, one of Sedona Prince, who put out a TikTok video that showed the disparities in what the tournaments were in two different places, Indiana and San Antonio, they had this big, lavish weight room. And then they gave us like a, a barbell, a couple of barbells and a, and a yoga mat. So she put on there the differences. So I, w I was the first coach to write a letter and post it and send it out. Um, and then some of the other coaches came behind that. And then, I, and then I went home after the tournament. I'm like, I'm out here on a national level asking for um, equality for, for women's basketball. And I come back to South Carolina and I'm, I'm not even getting that here. So I said, I'm gonna start here. Let me. And I was due for renegotiations. And I said, uh, I'm, I'm gonna risk it all. I'm gonna ask for equal pay. Um, and it took probably five or six months for it to happen. Cause these things don't just, you know, you don't walk in and here's what I did. I, I did a little research and it wasn't hard. I looked and saw what the men's coach was making, right, at South Carolina. I looked at what I was making and then I saw that his raises, like his raises, just his raises 
and I compared them to just my raises. And he, he made more than me in the raises. It, it wasn't a salary, but he made more in the salary, but it was the raises. Our success was not the same. You know, our success was sustained over nine years. He went to the final four once. And, and I was like, there is something seriously wrong here. Like, seriously wrong here. So I was like, okay, I, I have an agent, but I asked my agent to stand down. I said, because I don't really think you can do what I'm going to ask for. So I hired a lawyer in South Carolina that really knew, they knew the people on the board, they knew, they knew the decision makers. So I hired him to renegotiate my contract and he was all on board with, this is supposed to happen. He was like, you're the best coach in this, you know, you're the best coach in the country, but you're certainly the best coach here at South Carolina. So I believe in this, so let me work on it. So you almost have to find one of them that really understands, you know, the, the workings of, of who makes these decisions. And, and I, I just thought he did a great job, but it was bigger than just me too. It wasn't just me. It was like, you know, you should, you, you should get, you should get just as much as your male counterpart. Not because, not because you do the same job. It's because you do the same job better. Like if you're, if you do, if you perform better, people will say, well, you are non-revenue producing sport. No, we're not. No, we're not. Give them the receipts. <laughs> yeah, no, we're not. Yeah. Revenue is, we have the highest attendance in the country that attend our game. National, we got national attendance records for the past nine years in a row. So somebody's paying for those tickets. Somebody's, the concession stands open. They charge them, probably not as much as those beers y'all got out there, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's revenue producing. And, and we're winning national championships. So we're, we're, we're you're, you're, getting a, you're getting a marketing campaign free of charge just off of our sweat equity of, of winning national championships. So there's revenue coming in. So, so for anybody out there that come under the umbrella of non-revenue, there is revenue in whatever you do. You may not be in the black, but you're, you're helping towards um, offsetting some things that you're doing as a program. Well, it's kind of messed up because people have this mentality that when it comes to um, women's sports, that you should just be happy to be there, right? Okay. Just in general. Uh, because even when you were addressing earlier about the disparity between the men's tournament, the the weight lift, the you know the weights and all that, the equipment that they got versus the women, it was so many people. Because uh, I reposted a lot of stuff, it was so many people that just kept saying, "Well, y'all don't make as much as the men." It's like, yeah, but they make enough to get more than one fucking barbell. Right, they, right, make, right, they, right. Make, they make that much, okay? <laughs> right. And it's it's the same, you know. In your case, it's like. Uh, w w even though your, your receipts are, are long and, and extensive, but it's like, if somebody called you greedy, your answer should be, so the fuck what? Right. <laughs> right? Like, yes, this is the money that, that I deserve. Another thing that was interesting about um, the tournament this year was that there were, I believe, 12 black female coaches that were in the tournament. You know, people may be surprised to know this, but I think in women's uh, college basketball, what, uh, it's something like 45, 50% of the players are black. Mm -hmm. And yet it's not a lot of black women who are heading programs. But seeing so many that were in the, in the tournament, um, why do you think that barrier still exists? Why, because you know, also, uh, before you answer the question, uh, I think something like 85 to 90% of women's college players graduate. So it's not, you know, so you got a whole crop of black women who have degrees. So it's not that, because sometimes they use that to hold it against uh, coaches. But why do you think this issue still persists today? Well, one, they, they don't treat us like a sport. That's one, they don't treat women's basketball like a sport. Two, it's, we, we've moved the needle as far as um, um, decision makers. Like there, there are a couple of more black ADs, especially in the power five conferences 
Um, but there aren't enough. There, there aren't enough people that are being intentional about hiring black women. It, it's a cycle. Like we're back in the good cycle now. Like more and more black women nowadays are getting more opportunities to be head coaches because it's popular now. And, and, and there's this thing called uh, um, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So if you hire a, a black women's basketball coach, you're checking the box off as well. And, and, and people are, are, are looking now. And they're, they're, they, they have an understanding of, you know, it's, you know, it's a law. Like, it really is a law that people haven't really been um, abiding by. So we need more people. We need more presidents who are, who are black. We, are, we need more athletic directors who are black because those are the people that are providing those opportunities for head coaches to increase those numbers. You grew up here at the Raymond Rosen Housing Projects. <laughs> uh, tell me about what, what that was like, what life growing up here in Philly was for you. I, I mean, it was, it was cool. Like, the people who grew up in the projects just thought, this is, this is, this is all right. Like, I, and I, it's the people that who don't grow up in the projects think the projects is so bad. <laughs> um, but I, I enjoyed it. Like, I grew up in, a, it's called, the, we called it the fourth block. So if you counted the, pro, if you counted the row homes that, that was around this big field, it was block one, two, three, four, and then it goes around. So we were block four, and we, we had a mean block captain. No, seriously, she was mean. <laughs> she, she, would, she would make sure that everybody, like, manicure their lawns. My father was a carpenter, so he would actually build fences. You know, we would actually cut the sidewalk off with a fence so nobody would come in front of our house. Um, so it was, it was cool. Like it was nice. And, and other parents parented us. Like we parent, the, the parents really were, the parents were able to just discipline any kid that grew up in the projects. And a lot of that is not happening right now. Um, I will give you a story though. There's a such thing. I mean, we were, the row home people were snobs if you could be that because there were there were high rises and there were row homes i never got a chance in my house like like i have i have uh, f uh, four other siblings my three oldest siblings they got a chance Let's, my brother's here todd where you at did, did you did you, okay so he's a snob too right <laughs> we're, the, we're we're closest in age so we never lived in the, the high rises. So in the high rises, you know, anything can happen and they smell bad. You gotta <laughs> take the elevator. They do crazy stuff in the elevator. And so I never lived in the high rise. I only lived in the row homes and the row homes we just thought were like the, the birds. Um, so, but it was cool. Like it was, was there, you know, was there drugs? Yeah. You know, was there violence? Yeah. But there was also just a protectiveness that went on within the neighborhood that there's certain things, like there were rules to the violence. You know what I'm saying? Like now there are no rules. You open fire in front of a crowd of people like it's nothing. Like, so, I mean, I grew up in a time in the projects where um, you, you, re you had a, a level of respect for, for one another. Mm. Um, is that where you developed a lot of your toughness and scrappiness and um, you know or how did you develop it yeah. during that time I'm the youngest of five I had three three older brothers two now one of them deceased um, my oldest brother my oldest I could talk about him because he's not here <laughs> but he was a bully <laughs> like seriously he was a bully before you know the, it was popular to be a bully like <laughs> And he was the oldest, so he would, he thought he could just delegate, like chores. Uh, my mother would tell him to clean the bathroom, so he would just tell, you know, you got, you got to clean the bathroom. Clean no bathroom. <laughs> Mommy told you, like, I would say that, and we would fight, like, the whole time. My brother 
right there. He's a quiet one. He didn't say very much. Um, but I was the one that they he picked on the most because he thought I was the youngest. Eight years separate us. We we got the same birthday, y'all. <laughs> I can't get nothing. Like I can't. I got to share my birthday with my oldest brother. Um, but yeah, in our household, we you know it was it was it was tough in our neighborhoods. I, I was the only girl that was playing football, baseball, softball, basketball. I, I, I played it all. So the, the guys really accepted me once I was persistent enough to know that I was just there to compete. Now their girlfriends had other stories. They thought I was there. No, I don't want your boyfriend. Like, <laughs> no, like, he stinks. Like, really. <laughs> when we play, he smells. Like, um, so they toughened me up and, and they, you know, they, they looked after me. They made sure that I didn't get any any into the riffraff of, you know, what it is to grow up in the inner city and and be a part of that. So I mean, I'm always f forever indebted to the guys because they could have just kept saying no, 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 but they they allowed me to play and hone my skills. I mean, you could hoop, so I mean, <laughs> they 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 should. <laughs> uh, I think what at Virginia you went to three Final Fours, three right? Final fours. So when you left Virginia, the WNBA didn't exist yet, um, and it was I think a two or three year gap before um, the league started. So during that time, you know, what was life kind of like for you? Um, well, I, I graduated from Virginia, and then and then I was I planned to go overseas. Sometime and like people were going over in September and October, um, but but at that time in '92, at that time, you know they didn't really want guards. They wanted post players. They wanted players with height because guards come a dime a dozen. So my mother, who actually she used to clean houses for people, like she cleaned the house of this this white man that that uh, owned a retail store. So quite naturally, she asked him if, if uh, he could give me a job, right? Y'all, I work retail for three weeks, right? <laughs> I used to run from the customers because I didn't want any interaction with people. And then my boss, you know, thought I was there to steal her job. So she gave me a hard time. Like, I'm like I don't want this job. I'm, I, this is just, you know, this is just, you know, something for me to do before I go overseas. But three weeks, I got my first paycheck. Well, I only got my first and only paycheck. And it was like 200 and something dollars. What am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> but I mean, it was back in 1992, but still like, I wanted to play basketball. And then I finally got the call to go over and play in Spain. And I signed a contract. My first contract was for $35,000. Mm -hmm. And that was just like maybe five thousand dollars a month, and that was that was pretty cool. I could I that was pretty cool at that time where and it was you know you had to pay taxes on it because because it was less than seventy thousand dollars. So I was bringing like cash home. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was doing until the you know the WNBA started. But did it at one point or at any point did it kind of dawn on you like wow I'm one of the best um, players in, in in the world to be honest. Yeah. And I have to work a retail job. I can't do what I love full time. Like, how much did you even think about that? You, you know who my a male counterpart was in 1992? Who was the, I was the player of the year in 1992 and from college. Larry Johnson. Mm. Grandmama. Grandmama. <laughs> he made 80 million. 80 million. 80 million. So, yes. But it, but it goes to, you know, it goes back to what you just said, like, we should be happy with what we have. Like, if, if if that was, you know, a picture, it would probably be women's basketball, like, you know, in the book, because we should be happy. And I guess not even women's basketball, probably women in general. And I guess some other people, some other demographics could say that as well. Like, you should just be happy with what you have. And and we shouldn't, like, we, we really shouldn't. I'm not saying go out there and and risk it all, because certain circumstances you 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 could go out there and risk it all. But there are others where you gotta you gotta fight small battles, like really small battles, and build towards that. Like one of these days, 
we're going we're gonna to be a sport. Like women's basketball is going to be a sport. And what I mean by that is, um, I don't know if y'all understand, like, like, it's men's basketball, like, it's men's basketball and tournaments, the NCAA tournament. And then they put all of, all of the other sports go into this one little pot of money. It ain't little, it's probably 300 and something million to put on championships. And then men's basketball is a billion dollar, I mean billions, billions. But, but they only negotiate the 300 and something million for all these other sports. If they let women's basketball stand alone, away from those other sports, we could generate a whole lot of money. A whole lot of money, we could stand on our own if you invest in women's basketball like you do men's basketball, if you invest in the WNBA like you invested in the NBA when it was 26 years old. Like, somehow I don't understand, like, isn't the money that we would make green just like everybody else's? That part I don't really understand. Like, why wouldn't you want to make as much as possible and be, you know, have successful leagues and successful um, programs like all across the country. Like it, there are people that are holding women's sports down and it feels good to them. Like it really feels good to, to say, y'all don't make enough, so don't expect enough. The men are making this much, so let us keep doing what we're doing. Like I don't understand, like it's, it's not gonna take any money away from the men's pot if you build us up. So. We're gonna keep fighting that fight. I don't know if it's gonna happen in, in the time that that I can see a change, but you know, I'm gonna I you know, I'm 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 in it to win it for everybody, for mm. women especially. So with that being said, because this ain't, this ain't a male bashing thing either, y'all. So don't <laughs> don't think that's it's all right, they can take it. <laughs> <laughs> um so with that being said. Would you, because you, sometimes, I mean, I don't know how aware you are, but sometimes when there's like head coaching openings um, in the NBA, your name comes up. Would you ever consider it? Like, I'm not really passionate about that. Like, I've never been, like, I've never wanted to jump even to the WNBA. Like, I, I, there's something about college basketball, like being able to be a dream merchant for young people. There's something about that that stays with me. Like I'm, I'm really not done with it yet. If I was done with it and I was searching for something else, but I, I'm gonna give you a story too. Like I did interview for the Portland Trailblazers job. Like it was a full blown interview and I took notes because I, I wanted, if, if there's another female that wanted to to go that route. Like I got the notes, I got what they asked, I got, I do, I, I, I recorded it, seriously, I did. So you was the fans, yeah. <laughs> you was the ops, <laughs> okay. Um, you know, but a lot of it was analytics, like they, they're big into that, and then a lot of it was, they asked me questions like, you know, how would I handle a superstar? And it's like, I mean, I, I got superstars on my team now, like, I treat them like people, like I really, I, there's a relationship. Like, it's, it's almost like recruiting. When you recruit a young lady, you're, you, want, you want everybody. I want, I want to talk to the parents. I want to talk to the boyfriend, if they got a girlfriend. I want, I want to talk to everybody that's going to have, you know, uh, it's going to be in their ear. And I would pro approach it the same way. Like, you know, I know those guys that don't like people in their space, they don't know who to trust. Well, I would try to get all the people that surround them that, that create like a, a, a family atmosphere. I, I would, and I know it's hard to kind of envision that because you're, you're talking millionaires and all that. They're, they're people. When it comes down to it, they're, they wanna get back close to what it's like to be normal. Um, and that's the part that, you know, the coaches that are very successful, in the NBA or on any level, they know their players. They take time to, to, to talk to them. They have lunch with them. They have dinner with them. They spend time and, 
And and that's you know what people want. I we 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 get to the point where we just we have a, like an emotional um, relationship. You almost have to, but nowadays it's becoming really hard because of nil. Mm. Like it's becoming more transactional um, because players are gonna do things that will help them win as far as money, and it's it's a real thing. I mean, I I think it's cool. Like some coaches are like. Uh, let's get rid of it. No, I'm like, okay, let's. And then we, I just finished up at our, our spring meetings where all the football coaches, men's basketball, women's basketball, we're all, you know, we're all together. And they're like, what are we going to do about NIL? What are we going to do about the players? How can we get it, get it under control? And I'm, and I did, I was in, I was in a meeting with these presidents and I raised my hand. I'm just like, there's really nothing that we can do. The players have, they they have all the juice. I'm like, well, how do we how do we think ahead? Like, what can where are some of the things that we can do as coaches and administrators to get ahead if we know that this is what the players want mm -mm. and this is what they're gonna get? Like, they got they got all the juice. <laughs> they get the money. You know, they can transfer. They can do all these things, and there is nothing that we can do about it. And we, I'm okay with that, so because I'm good at I'm good on my feet. I'm really good on my feet. I'm good at pivoting. I'm good at you know foresight. I'm good at just doing something. And and I'm not telling them what I'm doing because I don't want them to. They, want them to they steal probably it. got more resources than I do, especially <laughs> football and this basketball. Uh uh. But I'm I'm gonna do something for South Carolina women's basketball that I think would be pretty innovative and. Um, what I think the future is going to be for for where we are as as coaches and people in this sport, where where the players really get a chance to make decisions that you know for them. Mm. Well, I mean, and for people who aren't familiar, uh, NIL stands for name, image, and likeness. And now, college players are able to make money off their name, image, and likeness, and it's been a game changer, especially for female athletes yep. because it's it's the women's. Uh, players that have like the pop and Instagram accounts because they're so big on on social media. Um, but al along those same lines, I mean, do you ever think about like, man, if I was playing today, I mean, you might have been able to make money off that like me asymmetrical haircut you used to have. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it. <laughs> if, if anything, I would have been a stand-in for MC Light with my haircut. Um, yeah, I, I probably could have. I could have yeah. made. I you you yeah. could have made some dough. I, I, I could have, um, you know, but I, for, for, for our players, like I, our players, honestly, NLI went into effect last July, like July 2021. And when we recruited the players that are, some of the players that are on our team now, like the rising seniors, they were talking about NIL like in our home visits, like when I go to their home and we talk, so they're like, what about NIL? I'm yeah, like, I was going to ask you, do you, now yeah. our players just straight up that you recruit like, hey, how much money can I get? They want to know. I, or make, you know, as I'm a part of your program. They, they wow. Do. They want to know like mm -hmm. how, how much, what, what is it? What, what can South, how can South Carolina differentiate from, you know, whatever other school? And, you know, I, I give them a little spiel, but at the same time, I'm like, what if you don't produce? You still want that money? Like, you <laughs> average, hear a lot of crickets you on that one. You're <laughs> 1. 1.2, right? <laughs> 1. 1.2 points, no rebounds. You like 50% from the free throw line. Uh, like, what if you don't produce? They don't care about that now. <laughs> they, they don't, but, you know, it's, conver it's like real conversation. Like, that's how I talk to our players. Like, you know, if you, you know, it's, it, this was probably the hardest year. Not, it wasn't hard. It was just different. Because I'm having like our end of the year uh, meetings with our players and they're like, it's, it's less about basketball and it's more about like popularity. Like, mm -hmm. like, you know, I feel like I can do more. I can be more popular. I can if you allow me to do certain things. And I'm, I pull out that stat sheet and I'm just like, 
<laughs> do it. Like uh, you, you get an opportunity. So, but again, I'm like, I'm probably not the coach for everybody. I really am not. Like seriously, I'm not for everybody. If you can handle like real truth and real conversations, and like you're not gonna like it, but you respect it. Like the players, and I, they tell me some of the some of their friends are like, "How can you play for her?" Like, how? Because I'm just gonna I'm gonna tell it like it is. Like that's the only way that I know. I grew up in a household, youngest of five. I had a disciplined mother. Like a, she was a disciplinarian. Like she was. She didn't play. So, and I'm more like that. I mean, I have fun and all of that, but this, there, this, it's a business. If you're trying to grow and learn and do some things as a young adult, like right now, these are some life lessons. And I do, I do feel like this too. Young people measure your love like, their, like to their parents. And I have to tell them like, I'm very different than your parents because your parents don't want you to fail and they don't want you to be uncomfortable. They do everything in their power to make sure you don't feel the pain that they felt growing up. And it's, it's probably the biggest mistake because they're going to fail. I tell them I love you enough to allow you to fail. I do. I love you enough to allow you to hurt. I love you enough for you to have a bad game or bad month or even a bad season. Because if you're trying to get to the next level, you're going to have those days. And if you, can't, if you can't operate in that space, then you're not going to be at that next level. And that's not just basketball. That's just anything. You're going to have bad days that you're going to have to just fight through because the competition is waiting. They're waiting for you to fail so they can scoop in and, and take your raise or take your space. And that's what I try to prepare our players for. I'm wondering, though, if some of this is like a little generational because like, you know, you and I are, are, are close in age and like, I have a lot of younger journalists that come up to me all the time and they say, um, how can I build my brand? I hate that question. <laughs> oh, my God. I was like, well, first of all, stop. You're not a brand. Uh -huh. How you don't have a brand? You don't have a product mm -hmm. like, you gotta, like it, it doesn't work that way. You do the work. The work becomes the brand. Right. And so. Um, I'm glad that you confirmed that I'm not the only one who thinks that way. And I was like, they think I'm being mean, but I'm not. I'm trying to, to tell you, like, if you do the work, the rest of it that you want will come, you know? I, I can't talk like that to them. <laughs> I yeah, I know. <laughs> I You're like, I got to get them to my campus. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I got to tell them, yeah, okay, what's, you know, what do you, I got to go through the whole, what do you like? Okay, what is it? And then, and then. I set them up and then they gotta go do the, they gotta go do the work, but you do have to take them through every single step and then and and then their parents take over and then they're they're off. Like I got a, a text message. Parents like, um, my child gonna be home on August the sixth, because they got something to they got something to do. Like, well, they got summer school. They got they got all these things. She is going to be home August the sixth, but it's that's how they think. It's more of a business, and and I don't mind that at all, as long as it doesn't interfere with the sanctity of our team. Mm -hmm. um, when did you know that coaching was your destiny? I, I didn't. Okay, when did I know? Like I don't really look at myself as a coach. That's weird. It's mm -hmm. weird. I don't like. Like, I, I, I look at myself as, I've said this before, like just being a dream merchant. I'm, I'm so like full of what basketball has done for me. Like, like, like my cup runneth over when it comes to like the game and how I look at it and how, how what it's done for me and the debt that I'm just trying to repay. So it's almost like me repaying a debt that is so... Like I'm, I'm comfortable. Like I'm, I'm really comfortable in who I am, and how I can help young people. So it's more like just being a, a servant for mm. young people. Mm -hmm. So you don't. I mean, do you look at yourself as more of like a leader as opposed to maybe a coach, or maybe not even that? Um. I, I, I just look at myself as as doing the right thing, and I just so happen to have a title as a coach. 
<laughs> but if I wasn't a coach, I would be working some. I would be working with young people somewhere to help them figure out what that you know what they want to do in life. Mm. So uh, before I get you out of here, Don, there's a game I play with every guest that appears on the podcast. You like I I, I know what's coming. I know <laughs> uh, the game is called this or that. Give you two choices. You can only pick one. Right. Let me just warn you. This is where the controversy goes down. Okay. <laughs> This is where it does. Um, Mo Cheeks or Allen Iverson? Yes, I yes I asked you that in your own hometown because I care. <laughs> you, you, my all-time favorite player is Mo Cheeks. I know. <laughs> Mo, Mo Cheeks. I got to go Mo. Y'all hear that, Philly? Nail. <laughs> That's hard. Diana Taurasi or Cynthia Cooper? She's sweating a little bit. <laughs> you know, here's who I'm going to go with. Cynthia Cooper, because she did she she won championships in a row. Consecutively. Consecutively. In the league. And she was old when she did it. <laughs> she was seriously. She was old. She was a ringer in the yeah. WBA. Uh your 96 gold Olympic, your Olympic gold team, or the 2012 team that had Candace Parker, Maya Moore, Simone Augustus, Sylvia Files. That was the easy one. <laughs> 96. I wasn't even part of the 2012. Like that was the that was the that was the team in which I wasn't an assistant coach or I wasn't a I wasn't a manager or anything. Oh, yeah. 96 though. Yo, y'all team of whooping asses. We whooping asses. Yeah. 96 team whooping ass. Because <laughs> they say you know that's the 2012 team is a team. They say, well, is this possibly the greatest you know women's team of blah, 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 Olympic uh, women's team? And so. Yeah, yeah. They, they forgot about 96, so you, <laughs> you, you, you're putting us in a conversation, so we appreciate that. No, y'all number one. Like, okay, to me, right. y'all number one. Like, it's, it's not even a question, so I, I hear that. Uh, Jordan or LeBron? Oh, Jordan. Without question. Jordan. <laughs> you answered that, like, quick and confident. Yeah, Jordan, 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 Jordan. All right, and finally, your episode of Martin, when the Olympic women's team came on there, which y'all all remember when they gave Martin and Cole and them and uh, the fake Michael Jordan, uh, the, the business, or the Biggie episode of Martin. I, I love Biggie, but Biggie's, Biggie's second place on this one. <laughs> Real quick, I want to ask you about that episode. Like, what was that experience like? The best, like, like seriously, the very best. And, and I didn't know, like, I know when we sit and watch at home, it's 30 minutes and it's just, you know, the show. When you, when you actually appear on the show, it, you, you get there and you're there for an entire week. Like, we probably flew in on a Monday or Sunday. Um, we did nothing on the first day. The second day, we, we sat around this table and we basically just read our lines. <laughs> and that was it. And then we were done for the day. And then the next day was taping day. And then you, you do the segments not in sequence. They, they okay, we're going to do this here. Okay, and then, but when you're there and you're around them, because we all know them as Pam and Gina, right? <laughs> like, they don't want you to call them the character <laughs> names. But we only know them as Pam and Gina all of our lives. And then we got to start, got to call them to Ch the Sheena. Um, and and Tisha, Tisha, yeah. Right? <laughs> but I'm going to give y'all this inside scoop. Go tell Cheryl Swoops this, though. <laughs> so we were doing the scene in which you, oh, y'all, did y'all see the episode? All right, so y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all know when we came in the door, right? Of the apartment. Y'all remember that? Yes. Okay. I came in first, right? I was the first one. Well, when we were taping it, Cheryl Swoops wanted to come in first, right? <laughs> So the first time we did it, it was Cheryl, right? And the second time, you know, we were going out. They were like, hey, Dawn, we need you to go first. You come in the door first. It must have been my acting in the back. <laughs> right? So we did it, right? And Cheryl wanted to be the first one to go through the door. I said, well, go ahead, Cheryl. I don't care. Like, I'm on the show. I'm happy. <laughs> so we did it. She came out first, went back out. Hey, Dawn, remember, you, you come in first. And I had to tell her that I had to come in first. Um, so, but she wanted to come in the door first. 
I don't know if it was height. I don't know if they didn't give me my Emmy because I the look on my face, I should have won some type of award. But it was, it was super cool. But after you're finished the set, like a second after, boop, they go into the regular people mode. Just like that. Like it's it's a show, it's acting, and they turn it right off. But my Martin did invite us to to both of his homes. Mm. Like he had two homes. Um, one I, uh, one was closer to the set where we, he had a basketball court out back. And to this day, I don't know, we played Martin. No, he did, no, he did not challenge y'all to a real game. No, we just played. Oh, okay. Yeah, we just played. But he had on those, those sticky football gloves. Like, the, <laughs> like he was playing in the gloves. Well, why? I, was, I, I had no, I, I have no <laughs> idea. Like, I mean, what everybody's more? looking like, y'all see what, I mean, why is he, what? Maybe it was a germaphobe. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> and then he took us to his home in like Beverly Hills. And it was really, it was really nice. Like he was super cool. One of my prized possessions is, um, he, he sent me a director's chair. And I have this director's chair, like, from Martin, like, like uh, he, had a, he had a nice leather one. Mm. He sent me a nice canvas one, but I, I cherish it. <laughs> I cherish it. I still have it. Was it hard to, like, to stay in character? I mean, you were playing yourself, but you see a lot of times on Martin that the people on the show are trying not to laugh. Right. Like, did, was there any moment where you were, like, trying really yeah, like, yeah, we, not to I laugh? I mean, you had to hold it in, and you almost kind of knew when you were off camera. So you could you could laugh a little bit more, even even while you're in the set, because you could see the cameras moving on the side of you. But but by far, by far, one of the best experiences ever. Yeah, no, it was a phenomenal episode. And maybe he didn't think about this at the time, or maybe he did do it intentionally intentionally, but you know, what it did in terms of highlighting women's basketball was really kind of unprecedented then, you know. So he, I don't even know if he's aware that it left, it, you know, it was part of building a legacy, you know? I, I got to tell you, Martin came to um, South Carolina and performed um, in our gym, and I, I got a chance to go back to see him um, before the show started. You know what he said? He was like, congratulations, Dawn motherfucking Staley. <laughs> That's what he said when he first saw me. I was just like, damn, he remember me? I thought I was going to have to give him a whole skit. I was on the show, Martin. Uh, <laughs> you remember he, me one time? He remembered, like, super cool, super cool, super dope. Well, I think your success has just been so inspirational for so many women, girls, little girls that are watching, really, really everybody. And th the scary part is, is like, it feels like y'all are scratching the surface. That's what's so scary. You already got two ships under your belt. God knows how many more you have coming, but uh, I just want to thank you for spending this time with me, allowing us to get a little peek into what makes Dawn Staley, Dawn Staley. And I'm sure everybody out there, you know, y'all know uh, what she means to this community and to this city. So thank you, Dawn, and just much success. Thank, thank you. Hey, y'all. Like, I, I was on your show with Michael, yep, right? You were. We never, we, she never stood up. Like, it's, it was a seat that they were behind a desk. Yep. When I walked up to you yesterday, I saw you in the hotel. I was I couldn't believe she's taller than me, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I thought she was shorter because she's behind the desk. Behind the desk. And uh, you never stood up. No, no, yeah, I didn't. Because I mean, cause we also, we had it, so we were kind of, chained to the chair because yep. we had our like our IFBs were, were plugged in so you didn't necessarily want to like do a lot yep. of getting up and, and everything but it's cool listen I had to beat you at something since you whipped my ass in space so bad I'm <laughs> like at least I at least God thank you for making me taller than her <laughs> well look thank you guys for coming out and I really appreciate all the support you've given the podcast if you haven't listened to it and you should I have amazing guests like Dawn on all the time it's exclusively on Spotify. Jamel Hill is unbothered. Thank you all for everything.